many, many commitments that she has uh, with such a busy intellectual, public intellectual also, uh, cannot be here. So uh, I uh, am uh, happy to do this um, as uh, I was uh, very delighted to hear that uh, the Coach Hall team will be here uh, with us uh, in uh, these two weeks. Um, as I was getting ready for this, I was I read through uh, this curriculum vitae, and uh, I must confess it looks uh, nothing like most of the curriculum vitae that I've had to pour over uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks. I'm in the executive committee in the history department. I just read the faculty reports for you know 50 plus people, and uh, this looks very different. And this really um, highlighted why a person like Kostowski would be um, somebody that uh, is qualified for uh, such a title as a distinguished citizen. Um, <clears throat> I will present a couple of things that I think are very interesting that I'm going to be by way of introducing him. Um, he was um, <coughs> born in Jerusalem and then moved to Budapest in 1948. And um, went to uh, college at Goodbye University, but uh, was expelled from there for subversion in 1970 and put under police surveillance. Um, he was then um, forced to work as a machine operator in a Hungarian tractor factory. Um, you don't see that on many people's curriculum vitae, I have to say. Um, in 1973, he was sentenced to a suspended prison for anti-state investigation, um, uh, that is for distributing a manuscript uh, of a book uh, entitled A Workers, a Work in a Worker's State, which was you know, published uh, in exile. Um, in exile is outside of, of Hungary, though he was living in Hungary at that time. Between 1973 and 1989, he was blacklisted and banned from publishing. And we need to sort of pause for a second and think, you know, how can one be a public intellectual if one is banned from being able to publish for such a long period of time? Uh, and when you turn the page and look at the publications, it's fascinating because most of his publications that I have in front of me, I'm sure there's a lot in Hungarian in the Hungarian press, which you know there, there were too many to, to include here, um, but most of his publications appear before 1989. <laughs> How is that possible? Well, I'm sure there's a very interesting story or several stories about this uh, regarding uh, the way in which manuscripts are taken out of the country, smuggled, uh, published, uh, um, as in this case, mostly outside of Hungary, um, in French or in English or in German. Uh, for instance, uh, his, his first book, the one that um, the, the worker in the worker's paradise, uh, the state, uh, which uh, uh, he was put under interdiction for, was first published <coughs> in German, in Germany, um, and uh, later on um, appeared in English, in French, and um, in other languages. Um, so uh, he was able to function, being under interdiction of. Um, publication um, in Hungary, still as a public individual, by publishing mostly outside of Hungary, or as some is that, inside of Hungary. Um, he has been very active since 1989, uh, both as a writer and also as a member of parliament between 1990 and 1994. Um, he was elected to parliament um, in Budapest. Um, and uh, since then, he has visited several universities in the United States, um, Northwestern University between 1994 and 1995, then Bard College, and most recently, the New School for Social Research. <coughs> and in all of these cases, he was a visiting professor in political studies or political science. Um, in 1998, he received um, from Northwestern University, an honorary degree of Doctor of Humanity Letters. Um, and <coughs> as I understand it, um, he is currently working on a larger project 
that you will be speaking of to some extent here um, about uh, the evolution of post-communist media um, in um, Hungary since 1989. So please join me in welcoming Nikolaus Hasdi uh, as our distinguished citizen. you hear me? <laughs> thank you, Maria, very much for this nice word. And thank you for your attention. And thank you for the possibility to be here for the Institute. <clears throat> is this microphone working? Yes. No. It's for taping only. Ah, it's for taping only. OK, thank you very much. It's good to know. <laughs> OK. So when European communism collapsed in 1989. Modernity's most durable censorship was over in the nick of time. But since then, evolving a free press and democratizing the media has been a painful and sometimes unsuccessful struggle. I would like to review this process, focusing especially on how the global patterns of press freedom collide with the post-communist post precondition. <coughs> In the first place, I would like to sum up how, how the sometimes very different European and American norms of the free media are making their way into the laws, institutions, and attitudes of post-communism. Throughout this summary, I will use Hungary's development both as examples and indicators of the broader process. But first, in order to appreciate our gains and deplore our deficiencies, I have to go back one step into our not so far away pre-post communist times. Of the many possible one-liners to define what communism was, my favorite is that it was a modernization dictatorship, not as much that of the economy, but that of communications. The communist parties in power were always more ready to give up doctrines of ideology, economy, politics, military, than the principle of centrally controlled communications. Here is the maximum program of the system. People should think whatever the system wants them to think. And here is the minimal program. People should at least talk the way the party state wants them to talk. Throughout uh, thought and speech control, rather than the achievement of any other set of substantive social changes, was the single most universal feature of all communist systems. And its rules were applied whether the actual subjects subordinated to the rules were nomadic Mongolians living in yurtas or German small city petty bourgeois or Hungarian Jewish intellectuals. In the vast communist civilization, no other field did show greater uniformity than the communication laws and institutions. In fact, the centralized character of virtually all communications was the very civilizatory element in communism, the feature that made it a culture on its own, and yes, a new one. Of course, without the state property of all means of mass communication, the system could not have again and again subordinated all communications to the central will. This is where we have started after the change, but not, uh, not quite from the scratch. Whatever paradoxical it may sound, communism's centralized communications meant at the same time a great jump forward in globalization. Indeed, it would be misleading to see communism as only isolationist, 
in a selective and purposeful way. It was a globalized culture operated by mass communication experts who studied and followed at all times the international innovations in the media field. If you wish, already Stalinism had implanted a genuinely Western European feature, the so-called BBC model. And what Stalin did in radio, Khrushchev did it in television. Please don't forget that when Western Europe imported radio and TV, which originally were free trades in the US. At first, even the European democracies have nationalized and centralized them, all broadcasting. Of course, the BBC model, which today would mean impartiality or fairness, was a standard for communism for another quality of it, its national monopoly status that existed in Britain up until the 80s. It was a state TV, if you wish. In that respect, during the years of the Cold War, the only, different, the only difference between the left and the right side of the Iron Curtain consisted of an adjective. BBC served democracy, while Moscow Radio did even more so because it served people's democracy. With post-Stalinism, an enormous civilizational change took place inside communism. After the anti-totalitarian revolutions of Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia, Central European communisms have become restoration regimes. In the 60s, within the seemingly unchanged ideological and legal frameworks in fact, civilian niches were opened up. The greatest of changes was that the party acknowledged some of society's real needs and strived to control and direct their fulfillment rather than merely suppress them. Even backwardness, in comparison with the West, has been officially admitted. And from then on, the official raison d'etre of the regime was not anymore leading the humankind towards a new world, but catching up with the West. Well, they still added catching up, catching up and surpass. But even this slogan worked as an admission that the regime needs to be globalized. As I described in my Velvet Prison, one innovation of the cultural policies of post-Stalinism was a guided, controlled copying of Western cultural models in virtually every field where their implementation remained safe for the rule of the party. We see in today's China how far post-Stalinism communism, post communism can go to wit even to comprise the introduction of capitalism. Now, the beginning of post-Stalinism coincided with the dawn of the television era. In Hungary, television was a gift to the oppressed nation by Janos Kadar, the quizzling of the Soviets who helped put down the 1956 revolution. Television contributed a great deal to his famously successful consolidation of communism. If post-Stalinism was a sort of pre-globalization, pre television was the ultimate post-Stalinist tool, both isolating and internationalizing the nation. As a strictly centralized means of communication, it was an unequal propaganda device. But it also served to import Western patterns of culture, know-how, and consumerism. In no less than 10 years' time, many grateful Hungarians remember 1956, not as the year of the loss of the freedom, 
but the year when television was introduced. And American Westerns sh were shown for the first time. One of television's important role was to precisely demarcate the borderline between the admissible and the forbidden. I personally hold 1969, the year of Neil Armstrong's landing on the moon, for the turning point in the pre-globalization of the communist media. The authorities had to meet a humiliating choice, transmit it live or not, and whether they decided for or against chaining up with the US for the landing. From then on, it was truly difficult for the communists to claim dominance in human progress. Let me stress, this was not because Apollo was such a marvelous device. The, the program was such a marvelous technology. The Russians were not bad either in the outer space. The irrevocable moment came with the fact that the communist authorities could not afford skipping the live transmission and give instead an edited censored version of the next, uh, uh, on the next day. Something coming from the enemy reached indirectly to the home screens of communism, and everybody knew that everybody else in the world is doing the same at the moment. Janusz Kadar himself was so much aware of the double-edged globalizing impact of TV that he forced the country to keep two days television free every week. Until the very last days of the regime, the screens kept going black every Monday and Thursday. Officially, to keep time free for meaningful cultural activities. <laughs> <laughs> what he really meant was the warning. He recognized you are having global fun with TV, but please don't forget this is communism after all and we are in command. In my mind, this measure was an early example of globalization's unavoidable side effects, the global anti-globalization drive. We are 10 years after, and we find a varying degree of westernization um, in the media in the different post-communist countries. The most visible change is privatization, and the massive presence of foreign capital in the media market. I believe it is necessary to differentiate between privatization and democratization. By making a distinction between the two, I don't mean to join the critical tradition that pits freedom of trade against freedom of expression. Even if Karl Marx or Noam Chomsky would find plenty of vivid examples of that antagonism in any post-communist country, actually more than in the West, I need that distinction for a more practical reason, namely the post-communist media adapts more swiftly to the global, global patterns of commercialism than to the philosophy and art of covering democracy. Is that disparity good or bad for freedom of speech? Actually, it is good for the freedom of the press and it is bad for the freedom of the journalists. I will speak of poor journalists later, but as for the good news, East Europe's transformation shows once again the original democratizing dialectics of the linkage between free trade and free speech. There are quite a few new, democracy, new democracies where we only have as much press freedom that, uh, as the that comes with a privately owned media and the minimum variegation that comes with a 
diversified ownership. Of course, where the privatization process was conducted in a politically guided form, as in the case of Russia, even privately owned media can remain under government control. The privatized media will become independent from the state only if it was privatized in a non-political procedure. And that is practically nowhere the case in Eastern Europe. In many countries, there was not even a legal framework created to provide procedures for calling tenders, making the bids, and picking the winners. And when there existed legal framework, such as in the Hungarian broadcast privatization, it was carefully designed to legalize arbitrary political choices. But the new market environment might compensate for the lack of clean beginnings. For example, and uh, for example, almost all papers in Hungary fell prey to a so-called spontaneous privatization already before the collapse of the communist regime as the orphaned state-owned papers have, the, have, have themselves started to look for Western owners. Those papers were sold on the cheap and kickback must have, must have been involved on a large scale. But the results were paradoxi paradoxically beneficial. The self-privatized newspapers have become much faster independent-minded than their siblings meted out by the government. If they are able to retain and even multiply their audiences, this is thanks to their market-conscious behavior, a development that would not have come about under a government-designated, politically motivated owner. And what about the foreign owners in the media? As a rule of thumb, we find the mass and diversification of the private media a more reliable indicator of freedom than the nationality of the owner. I would even dare to say that the presence of foreign capital, provided it, is, provided it is diversified, is one of the strongest guarantees for professionalism, for responsiveness to the public, and for independence from government. Also, given the heated arguments from ethnopatriotic to anti-globalist, from brown to red, to red-brown, the governments who dare to sell out to foreign owners are typically more relaxed vis-a-vis -vis press freedom. While the governments like the Belarusians, which keep the public media in a dominating position and keep the private media in the hands of hand-picked national capital, are obviously less so. There is a specifically post-communist abuse of ownership, the renationalization of the press. Fav favoritist governments appropriate taxpayers' money to create press outlets for the governing parties. The ideology for that is sometimes to help the national press as opposed to the foreign-owned, at other times, it is to balance the supposedly leftward leaning or liberal mindedness of the press. This quasi revolutionary theory of counterbalancing argues that the alleged unbalance, that is, criticism of the government, has nothing to do with the nature of the media. It should be a remnant of communism. But ex-communist socialist parties also tamper with the press when they are in government, except they somehow don't need any ideology to do so. The methods are various. 
1992, the ruling Conservative Party in Hungary forced 20 private companies to establish and endow a publisher. For the Hungarians in the room, this is a Publica RT, and the paper found it was Napi Magyarorsa. The next ruling party, the Socialists, forced a bank to buy shares of a paper published by their foundation. This was Sabat Föld. The presently ruling neoconservative party has nationalized that very bank, and of course with it, its hoped press portfolio. And then it reprivatized the dailies for the very advertising company that manages the electoral campaign of this party. This is Mohir and Magyar Nemzet. Apart from this, all governments have the bad habit of helping their favorite papers by directing advertisement revenues their way. This is how in Russia, Yeltsin and Putin have traditionally held in their hands practically all papers of the countryside. These features are evidently not in conformity with Western patterns. Maybe a law would help, somewhere along the lines of the First Amendment, forbidding all and any taxpayer money or any government presence in the print press? I'm afraid it would not. These examples prove that even the best of laws could and would be bypassed until democratic decency settles. In Western Europe, no piece of law forbids the governments from supporting newspapers, and they still don't do it. What should disappear is the unreformed post-communist belief that the press is something to be subservient to parties or governments. So what are the chances and the necessary stages of that evolution. For the sake of clarity, I tried to tell apart seven days of creation, seven global patterns that all should become fresh, flesh and blood of post-communist institutions, laws, or mentality before a truly free press can evolve and sustain itself. Some of them are self-evident, Others may be surprising since they had evolved into global patterns in an unnoticed evolutionary way. Please don't take these stages as necessarily consecutive, neither as irreversible ones. Alas, too many post-communist democracies have stumbled and fallen back on their road to a free press. The existence of a democratic institutional order is the very first precondition, a seemingly easy one. Yet we still don't have all the institutional guarantees of political democracy at hand in all post-communist countries. The most important ones are free elections, multi-party system, constitutionality, and the separation of the branches of government. By now, it has become one of the common places of post-communism, backed by a whole library on illiberal democracy, that a freely elected government is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for press freedom. And without a free press, the freedom to make one's choice between parties becomes void, as we cannot get information about those parties. That's why even the free elections can turn into their own parodies, as it was shown in Milosevic's Serbia, or, some, or in some of the post-Soviet stands. The republics south to Russia uh, in, 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 in Asia. Targeted legislation to secure freedom of the press is my second day. <coughs> A somewhat paradoxical second precondition is um, <coughs> legislation, a passage of dedicated laws to secure press freedom. 
This is something very European, apart from being a post-dictatorial necessity. While for the American thinking, it is precisely the lack of legislation that is the dearest piece of guarantee. The continental Europe and the post-communist Europe even more so cannot build a free press without delivering a whole series of targeted legislative laws. The reasons are many for, let me mention only a few. Most continental democracies are post-tyrannical or post-dictatorial systems, and that is post-sensorial in the same moment, at the same time, <coughs> and most of them are nation states that have to defend or at least to pretend defending their national culture. And the huge taxpayer paid public service broadcasting, public service broadcasting system belongs to their respective national identities constitu constituting a stiff element of Europeanness at the same time. As I already have indicated, in the new democracies, quite a few otherwise evolutionary patterns of press freedom could be secured only by targeted laws. Most of them in radio, TV, and the more modern means of communications in the field of, uh, of, communi of uh, broadcast communications. These are the famous media laws, bones of constant contention in all new democracies. They consist of two baskets of new standards. The countries which are able to pass them in one sweeping reform package are typically the fastest in catching up with the rest of the world. Before anything else, we need to transform our inherited vast state monopoly TV and radio into an autonomous one. So it is state broadcasting into public broadcasting. These institutions have to get statutes that protect them from the government but at the same time, they should be obliged to provide impartial, plentiful, and balanced information. The archetype of these statutes is the BBC guidelines. In Hungary, the passage of that single piece of law took seven years, during which the public TV and radio still remained monopolist. In quite a few post-Soviet republics, even today, there is considerable resistance to this initial step. Whatever minimal this reform seems to be, it's the step from a majoritarian understanding of democracy to a liberal one, where we are protected even from a dictatorship of the majority. In 1995, I participated in a conference in Vienna where the leaders of post-communist televisions were sharply divided on the question whether or not the mandate given to the government in free election is a mandate at the same time for the public media to serve the government. Many said in credible indignation that should a law in their country oblige the state TV to keep equal distance from all political forces, that would amount to an obligation of the broadcaster to serve the opposition. As if in the elections, the people would not have already decided who should lead the country. The other great package of post-communist media legislation is the dissolution of the monopoly, the creation of a dual or mixed system, the licensing of some privately owned commercial broadcasting channels alongside the state-owned ones. With that, we are paying tribute to America, to the US, but only to a moderate extent, just like it is comme d'habitude in the whole of Western Europe. The whole idea of the privately owned commercial media is surprisingly new in the whole of Europe. 
it started mainly in the 80s. The post-communist countries have joined in, in a decade later, so we are not that much behind. But while public broadcasting is in retreat everywhere in Europe, total privatization is still inconceivable. In quite a few post-communist post countries, even modest privatization has run into strong opposition. An anti-globalist lobby tried to depict even a dual system as Americanism, which, could, which, which would consist, I mean, Americanism would consist, of course, what as mean commercialism, cult of violence, the crippling of national cultures, and everything that left and right-wing enemy images have produced since the Second World War. Nevertheless, in Hungary, Istvan Churka's far-right movement is the only force that speaks out against any privatization. And even they are less vocal about this since they have managed to get a radio station of their own. Actually, Rush Limbaugh could come to learn something at Ponon Radio in Hungary. <laughs> it would not be a popular proposition anyway, given the enormous success of the private channels. Already one year after their licensing, the balance tilted towards the commercial TV, and today the rating of the state TV is consistently below 10%. I believe that actually about this um, anti-Americanism that so strictly tied to the media issues that uh, the Central and East European audiences are no more buyers of are no buyers of any new edition of political or cultural anti-Americanism, be it West European anti-globalist edition or the old type. Soviet sponsored anti imperialism. And here's the third precondition for a free press to flourish it is a consensus among the political parties about the necessity of self, self, self constraint by the government. Without a mutual willingness to grant minority rights, opposition rights, and media freedom, no media legislation would work. But in most newly liberated nations, the anti-majoritarian features of democracy have no considerable homegrown tradition. It is the magic moment of a fresh start that helped to implant it. There seems to be a linkage between the negotiated peaceful character of democratization, typical for the Central European post-communist countries, and the ability and the ability of the first freely elected governments to exercise self-constraint later in dealing with the press. The handshake tradition, the handshake transition, as I called it elsewhere, is a great supplier of re replacement liberal tradition and both the work of the earlier summits that opposition, that is the free press movement in, late, in the late communist times, and the willingness of the late communists to succumb to free elections helped to bring about the great moment of the initial consensus. The good news about Hungary is that the initial consensus worked marvelously and it has lasted for 10 years. The bad news is that the liberal spirit of the handshake has not cemented into a proper tradition. The third freely elected government started majoritarian policies and if a, any, any given government does not want to exercise self-constraint self in the media field, and it is out to find, to find loopholes for circumventing the consensus-forcing laws, 
then even a place like liberal Hungary, we are we might back to square one after so many years, and we have to rely on the wisdom of the people once again. A fourth precondition of the stability of post-communist press freedom is the existence of a reliable constitutional authority above the parties, such as the Supreme Court in this country or the Constitutional Court in Hungary. If the original handshake was unable to produce some powerful guarantees of enforcement, the initial consensus among the parties wears off very quickly and vanishes in noisy parliamentary bickerings. Not even a constitution consisting of the nice principles will be sufficient. The decisive step is to establish a joint archimedical point and it needs to be working all the time. The difference between an accepted constitution and an enforced constitution is all that press freedom is about. There is a Hungarian legal team um, that in the 90s, in the early 90s, helped some post-Soviet republics to write their new constitution. The experts have done their best, and the press freedoms that figured in those constitutions were even more strongly formulated than in our own handshake produced constitution. But the framers have lost their confidence in the workability of their exported constitutions because the customers in, the st in some of the stands have deleted the chapters on the Constitutional Court. The fifth is, surprisingly, media wars. All post-communist countries must go through media wars. These are ugly destructions of public peace, but are unavoidable for press freedom. What are media wars? They are started by governments, either by not passing the democratizing laws, media laws, or by abusing the existing ones. A typical warfare is the occupation of the state-owned radios, radios and TVs, that is sending partisan envoys to these autonomous institutions. Many of you will remember the recent events in Prague when the editors of State TV, of the State TV news, have protested against such a move and 100,000 civilian protesters marched in the Wenceslav Square in solidarity. Many important patterns of press freedom can be mastered by post-communist democracies only with the help of defending themselves in the media wars. The most important of those patterns is that even under democracy, there is no freedom without fighting for it. And that it is, that freedom is too precious to be let over to the government. An equally important lesson to be learned in the media wars is that in democracy, the fight for press freedom has to be won in the legal arena. A post-communist media war is frighteningly similar to a cold civil war, with all the branches of, uh, of power getting involved and pitted against each other. Governments and heads of, this, of, of the Republic, the Constitutional Court, the Parliament, the media bodies, the prosecutions, nothing will be spared out of the strategies of the various. In Hungary, it was Josef Antal and Arpad Gönc. In the Czech Republic, it was Václav Kors and Václav Havel. 
In Slovakia, it was Vladimir Mecha versus Mihal Kovac. This is but a brief list of the high protagonists. In 92, a government MP, member of parliament in Hungary, even started a hunger strike in the parliament building in protest against a TV program that he alleged criticized, in, criticized his party. The six-day necessary day, I would say, is the working, the operation of the revolving stage of politics. In the theater of democracy, three players define the outcome of the post-communist media wars, the political class, the parties, the public, and the press itself. The wars are started to get the press to get the public. Without the sixth precondition, that is the disciplining experience of the peaceful alternations of power in repeated free elections, none of the players can be secure that the media wars are of no avail and that subjugating the press will only backfire. And before that lesson will be learned, probably several electoral defeats have to be earned by warring governments. In Hungary, three consecutive free elections were not yet sufficient to dissuade the governments from the media wars. Without the working of the revolving stage of politics, the politicians will remain aggressive, the press will remain both weak-hearted and partisan, and the public will remain cynical about both the press and the government. But the politician must learn that grabbing the press won't help. The press must learn that it does not have to fear the politicians, and the public must learn that the press is their agent, not that of the politicians. And we are at the seventh day. The most powerful guarantor of, of, of a freedom of the press is a free press itself. A professional maturation of journalists in skills specific to democracy, this would be the seventh day. The actual aim of the whole process where the creation of a democratic media can finally have a rest. What's the legacy? For our present day communist democracies, it is an impediment that the whole of the media intelligentsia was brought up as propaganda journalists, socialized in a world of unilinear, partisan, promotional guided information and lack of editorial autonomy. It is true that in the last decades of communism, the journalists did not anymore have a hot ideological commitment. On the contrary, they had a rather cynical attitude towards any type of commitment and towards their own profession. But covering a multi-party scene demands special skills and a new commitment to the continuing openness of the political process. Take the example of the Russian press in the presidential elections. It provided a sad evidence that not even the commitment of journalists to democracy is the same thing as an ability to maintain a free press. In 1996, the Russian journalists may have thought that they contributed to the survival of democracy by being openly biased in favor of Yeltsin against communist candidate Zyuganov. But in 2000, at the election of Putin, the war in Chechnya robbed them of any such 
democratic pretext for bias. Today, we are still quite far from that seventh day. Post-communist post journalism has to go a long way before it will become a professional, self-confident safeguard of its own freedom. As I have mentioned at the beginning, poor journalists have fallen from one centralized censorship into another more fragmented one, that of commercialism. Many of them can't be consoled by the competitive character of their trade that, make it, that makes it possible for them to change censor if they are lucky. Even worse, commercialization emerged before ethics could have consolidated. Between fear from unemployment and enticements of side revenues, few can think of being professional apart from earning as well as possible. Fear is also the key word, but the journalists too, or rather the socialization in the old regime, can be blamed for their responsiveness to the pressure. Here are the two extremes. How that unlucky socialization adapts to present-day post-communist pressures. One type of inadequate political journalism could be called partisan, which adapts to the multi-party environment by choosing a party, but otherwise continues the professional trickeries of the old transmission belt or propaganda journalism. The other extreme is politics bashing or politician bashing that tries to look at politics from such a height, from such a distance, from where all the details look identical. Of course, identically feeble. This latter kind of journalism thinks of itself as independent, but in fact, both types are a product of fear from real objectivity on the one hand, and a lack of commitment to the whole of the democratic process on the other. Investigative journalism is a typical unsuccess story of post-communist media. Among the many pretexts for that failure, the most popular ones are lack of funding from the publisher and lack of responsiveness from society. We publish our revelations in vain, but our politicians just cannot get ashamed. This is how the complaint goes. But the real reason, I believe, is that nobody teaches and nobody studies how to produce investigations in a way that makes it binding for democracy's institutions to start dealing with the revelations. Let's, let us call this missing professional knowledge scandal enforcement in fact, it would require journalists to understand their own profession as a function of democracy. As you can see, I think that a truly free post-communist media is still floating somewhere between the first and the seventh days of its own creation. The days that I have tried to define go somewhat hand in hand, around and around. Nevertheless, please be assured that there is no way back to unfreedom. The hardware of press freedom is in place in most new democracies, and the software gets updated. 
at least we see quite clearly where we are heading and that knowledge is already a bit of the sweet rest of the seventh phase.